These images were the work of Alfred Hitchcock. Ivor Novello played a mysterious stranger in a story inspired by Jack the Ripper. When the film was shown to its distributor, he was horrified. Your picture is so dreadful, he told Hitchcock, that we're just going to put it on the shelf and forget about it. Hitchcock had made the mistake of regarding film as an art. It may have been elsewhere in the world. In England, the word arty was an insult. The British film industry was crippled by this Philistine, unadventurous outlook, an outlook shared by many of the British public. As Charles Bennett found when he was acting in a film in Tewkesbury. It was very funny because uh, the well was bad, and we had this wonderful director, George Pearson, determined to get the stuff. So the first really fine days was Sunday, and they decided that we had to get the stuff on a Sunday. But the people of Tewkesbury said, no, nobody shoots on a Sunday. So they turned out with, you know, weapons and things like that, uh, spades and stuff like that to try and stop us. There are no more beautiful places in the world in which to make pictures, wrote an American critic. But the English do not know how to make films. Britain had emerged from the war with its landscape intact, but many of its attitudes frozen in time. Its cinema seemed a backwater. All the progress of Europe and America seemed to have passed Britain by. And there was a general indifference towards British films. The industry had advanced little beyond the barns and greenhouses in which it began. Temporary studios like these were now housed in more solid buildings, but the equipment was still a trifle basic. The first proper film studio was built in 1914 by Gaumont in Lime Grove. The tiny seaside studios at Shoreham in Sussex were the most unusual. They were run by a community of film technicians, carpenters and stage players. Director Sidney Morgan arrived in 1919. We took over this glass house among the pe pebbles which it was a quite extraordinary because that was built just before the war with this absolutely marvellous glass and it even had um, a tank underneath which it was rumoured in Shoreham that the Germans who were associated with it had built this tank so the submarines could come up. It was an absolute cottage industry quite extraordinary and we did some very very good work the films made at shoreham were mostly adaptations of novels like other british films they were made for very little money and a few were profitable in a small way in the british market we, we thought awfully small and awful tendency to think in rather small old-fashioned terms if you look through the backlog of stories bought, made or not, by any little British company of that time, there weren't many big ones, you'd find that they nearly all was old ideas, like Victorian melodrama. This film, directed by Cecil Hepworth, shows his technique of linking every shot with a fade. Alma Taylor was the leading actress in this story set in the Yorkshire Dales. A feeling for the English landscape gave Hepworth's work distinction, but it was not enough to enhance the reputation of British cinema. Yet the British almost invented the cinema, and they led the field for the first few years. The British showed the world techniques involving close-ups and editing that no one else had thought of, and British films were in huge demand at the turn of the century. Even a simple comedy could carry a surprise. 
like this camera movement revealing the White City exhibition of 1910, taken from a giant fairground attraction called the Flip Flap. But as early as 1913, interest in British films began to fade and audiences abroad complained of their dullness. The Americans saw Britain as an ideal location. They made a spirited version of Ivanhoe using Chepstow Castle. Its director was the American Herbert Brennan, born in Dublin. To take advantage of such British institutions as the Derby, the famous American comedian John Bunny came over with director Larry Trimble. En route to Epsom, John Bunny delights the racegoers. Trimble exploited the Derby for a comedy. The following year saw a tragedy. A suffragette ran under the king's horse and was killed. A shocking event captured by the newsreels, which were already full of suffragette protests and arrests. They were an easy target for the film industry, which derided them with films like this one by Percy Stowe, in which the husband of a suffragette dreams he is prime minister and sets out to teach women a lesson. The idea that women were incapable of heavy work was turned on its head by the war, when the cinema was only too pleased to show how women kept the country going while their men were at the front. After the war, women won the vote and promptly revealed their industrial power. Their men, promised a land fit for heroes, returned to the same old slums and a post-war slump. The one thing that survives in a depression is entertainment. All over the country, cinemas were being built. Investors, who were only too glad to put money into buildings, refused to do the same for films. They knew that once the cinemas were completed, they could make easy money on films from America. American stars were much more acceptable to the British than the British. Mary Pickford and Douglas Fairbanks, here arriving at Southampton, were the world's most popular stars, together with Charlie Chaplin, born in London, who came on a visit from Hollywood in 1921. Why did British stars never see crowds like this? I, I'm quite certain there was a very great deal of snobbery among the theatre people, the theatre actors, and things like that, to the people who did cinema work, who were, who were film actors. Stage actor John Gielgud first appeared in films in 1924. I, I certainly, the actors I worked with in my early days never talked about their days of filming. As I say, I was very surprised when I saw so many films in the late 20s and 30s in which so many of the actors I had worked with were appearing. I had no idea they were doing this on their off days. Sir Herbert Beerbohm Tree was a staunch supporter of the cinema. He made this film for a group of Americans operating from Twickenham Studios. Beerbohm Tree's son was the future director, Carol Reed. <laughs> Gerald de Maurier was a great actor who disliked the experience of making films. And I think that he set the tone, which was that if we did films to make to pay the income tax, it, it was better to keep just to take it as a, on the chin and shut your eyes and do it. <laughs> think of England. <laughs> as British studios tried to catch up with the rest of the world, they began using artificial light on interiors. Freddie Young was an assistant cameraman. And in those days, the lighting was pretty crude. We had what they called Labarden arc lamps, the French lamps in the studio, and a mixture of daylight through the glass studio, and uh, these arc lights on the floor. 
It was more what you would call illumination rather than lighting. There was enough money to light this Shakespearean production, but little for sets and none to heat the studio. Even in so prestigious a film as Hamlet with Forbes Robertson, the cameraman manages to miss the great actor entirely. And although he does his best to catch up, the idea of a retake seems altogether too extravagant. As enemy agents fire at the police, a door swings open on this set. It seems perfectly natural until it mysteriously shuts. Enlarging the frame shows a moment which a retake could so easily have corrected. British films had a struggle to compete. Little Dorrit was a faithful adaptation of Dickens. Directed at Shoreham by Sidney Morgan and featuring his 15-year-old daughter, Joan. The best thing I ever did was Little Dorrit. It was... It had always such integrity, and it was a wonderful part and a wonderful film. That such a film should be lost is a tragedy, but typical. All that remains are these fragments on 9.5 millimeter, which have preserved little of the quality of the original. I would say that we were all very sincere. We loved it. There was no question of um, skullduggery. It was a very, in a way, rather innocent industry and there were a lot of nice um i mean there was mr baker of butchers who was as english as you know very simple they were very really most of the people cecil hepworth it was all terribly english it was extremely english and it was based mostly on english subjects and of course we did have one lovely asset the english countryside with a lot of our exteriors and that sort of thing and of course we got english literature to draw on english literature was a gift to the americans too they made Dickens' Oliver Twist with Lon Chaney and Jackie Coogan. Because the Americans, you see, they were at their absolute peak in those days with their marvellous pictures. They could afford, of course, to rent them out for far less than, than, they, than we could possibly compete with on a picture of that. And so what they did was they had this method with block picking. Literally, if you want Mary Pickford, you've got to take the rest of our output for a year. This meant that even when Britain did make a film of high quality, few people saw it. Morris Elvey was Britain's most prolific director, but was little seen in America. For this film, he went to Monte Carlo, and with the Stoll Company's Belgian cameraman, Paul Bourget, he brought continental flair to this adaptation of a famous novel. The film played with time, presenting the story in flashbacks and flashes forward. Here, a policeman makes a terrible discovery. We see how an innocent girl is involved in a murder committed during a crystal gazing seance. Made in the Trossachs in Scotland by W.P. Colino, Rob Roy had the vigour of any American historical film. Freddie Young doubled as assistant cameraman and stuntman. We would work uh, six days, sometimes seven days a week, and we'd work till the small hours of the morning very often with no overtime. But nobody seemed to mind because, you know, we were all interested in our jobs. Fascinating uh, business, uh, working in films. Rob 
Roy was one of the few British films to be shown in America, but not widely enough to be successful. What England needed was a producer like Pathé in France or Palmer in Germany. The City of London regarded the idea of investing in the industry with ill-disguised contempt. One could hardly describe Cecil Hepworth as a mogul, although his was still a name to conjure with. He had pioneered British cinema with films like Rescued by Rover. Many adventurous films had been made under his banner. During the war, he was advisor to the Ministry of Information and produced many propaganda films, including this short with Henry Edwards and Chrissy White, who parody the acting of melodrama. A poet has his work returned for the umpteenth time. Edwards and Chrissy White became Hepworth's most popular stars. They played everything from peasant to the ruling class, and Edwards directed his own films under the Hepworth banner. He and Chrissy White, whom he married in 1922, were the nearest Britain came to Douglas Fairbanks and Mary Pickford. In a way, I think people, uh, you know, sort of thought we were sort of something apart. Because I remember ages afterwards, my husband and I went in somewhere and, and you know, people in a restaurant, people came up and said, oh, do you eat? You know, they just sort of, you know, couldn't believe that we were real people. This newsreel shows them visiting the Royal Pump Room at Leamington Spa. Of the 16 films they made together, only two survive. Hepworth's studio at Walton-on-Thames shut down in 1922, prior to expansion, he said. But the block booking system kept his films on the shelf for 18 months. With his capital tied up for so long, he was losing money. And he lost enthusiasm, spending more time on his boat than in his studio. He tried to make a comeback with a remake of an old favorite, Come In Through the Rye, but it was a static melodrama full of titles. It was shown in America, and a critic said, it makes one want to shoot everybody that had a hand in its making. Cecil Hepworth was bankrupt by 1924. It was left to Hollywood directors to make sure that the glories of old England were seen on the world's screens. Harry Millard directs the British emigre actor Percy Marmont at Leeds Castle. John Barrymore as Sherlock Holmes, directed by Al Parker. And some directors decided to stay. There are a lot of American directors who were on the, on the skids, as they say, or maybe not quite so successful, uh, were over here, last gasp sort of stuff. Ivor Novello and Gladys Cooper were considered strong enough to bring audiences to The Bohemian Girl, but American director Harley Knowles persuaded the legendary Ellen Terry to take a subsidiary part. The star-studded cast ensured a showing in New York, Nell Gwynn, with D.W. Griffith star Dorothy Gish, was one of the first films to win real success in America. It was directed by Herbert Wilcox. Other 
American stars who played in British films were Betty Compson, Norman Kerry, who in Hollywood acted in Phantom of the Opera, and Betty Blythe, star of The Queen of Sheba. You see, one thing which we did, which was rather sad, was bringing over faded stars of theirs in the hope of getting a showing in America, but we never pulled it off. They wouldn't take our pictures. They really didn't take our pictures. Oh, no, it was much more in it than just a question of money and that sort of thing. It was uh, power, in a way. Hollywood's power was demonstrated by Herbert Brennan's smash hit, an English story with English actors like Ronald Coleman, whose appearances in English films had impressed nobody. Britain would lose more and more actors to America. Clive Brook went over in 1924 and shot to the front rank almost at once. Leslie Howard found little work in silent films and played on the London stage until, once again, Hollywood discovered him. Joan Morgan played opposite American comedian Bryant Washburn, who thought so much of her ability that he offered her a contract to work in Hollywood. Her father went to see Washburn and his director, and Joan Morgan wished she'd gone too. He came back and her mother was absolutely shaking. So we said, well, he said, well, um, they said to me, what do you think of this offer we've made your daughter? And I said, not much. And that was the end. I was not a pushy 15. I mean, some girls nowadays of 15 would have leapt in a taxi and go around, you see. And I didn't. I just died inside. Of course, you can imagine going back to the flat at Richmond with October, nothing to do until next May when we started at Shoreham again, and the winter and walking along the towpath and thinking what it would have been like to be in Hollywood. And I mean, it was absolutely death. The crowds who packed the West End never realized how closely their cinema going was controlled from America. But few of them would have missed the latest Mary Pickford. She admired England and recreated it on a magnificent scale in Hollywood, playing everything from Little Lord Fauntleroy to a Cockney laundress. Betty Balfour was the nearest English equivalent. Her character of an exuberant Cockney brought her immense popularity. But the cinema's attitude to the working class was patronizing. All too aware of the class system, British filmmakers tried to avoid offending anyone. But in one area, the film was remarkable. Director George Pearson used concealed cameras to shoot this scene in Piccadilly Circus. Even the policeman was taken by surprise. George Pearson had left school teaching to make films. He was one of the few believers in the cinema as an art. George Pearson was a really lovely man, a wonderful, a lovable character. He was very much the old school. He knew everything there was to know about films. And he was very willing to impart his knowledge to us, the younger generation. Well, of all the moments in the film story, the two minutes silence was the most important. Armistice Day was marked each year by a two-minute silence in which everything stopped. How could Pearson express its spiritual quality? So I pondered and pondered, and at last, well, I think I've got it. Anyhow, whether I have or not, I know I did get it into many hearts in that trade show of the film. Pearson was taking a risk. Inspired by Griffith's use of symbolism, he abandoned conventional narrative. And when we reached the moment of two-minute silence, the conductor 
of the band, what is bet on down, all the Emerson's stopped. And in that theater, crowded from gallery right down to stores, you could have heard a pin drop. got home. It really had got home. The two minute silence. The greatest moment in the film. And I think the greatest moment in any film that I've ever made. Ravelli was acclaimed as a national film. A contender for that title might have been Fox Farm with its English look. Guy Newell directed and acted in it with his wife, Ivy Duke. The beauty of the English countryside was caught by cameraman Hal Young, whose career had started in America. The film took a surprisingly unsentimental view of rural life. After some reshooting and retitling, Hitchcock's film finally reached the public. The Bioscope called it possibly the finest British production ever made. But there wasn't much about it that looked British. It could have been the latest release from the German studios. Alfred Hitchcock was English enough, the son of a Leighton Stone greengrocer, he got his first job at the Islington Studios. This old power station was owned by the Paramount Company, which hoped to make British films to Hollywood standards. American directors like George Fitzmaurice helped to train Hitchcock before the studio closed in 1922. Uh, I was very content when um, uh, they were going to form a new British company when the Americans closed down and I was going to get the job in as assistant director. So um, I got that job and then they said, well, uh, do you know of a good writer we can get? I said, I'll write it. So um, 
They said, well, what do you know about writing? So I said, well, I've worked in the editorial department for a couple of years at Paramount, and that gave me a contact with the writers. So I tried my own hand at writing the script, and here is a sample. So they looked at it, and I got the job. And then my friend, who was going to be the art director on the picture, he said he couldn't come. He had another job. He said, what are we going to do for an art director? I said, I'll do the art direction. Hitchcock set for Woman to Woman, which he also wrote and on which he worked as assistant director. Hitchcock's boss, Michael Balkan, sent him to the Ufa Studios in Berlin, where British films were made under a co-production agreement. Given the greater resources of Germany, Hitchcock revealed his talent as a film designer. And I think Hitch was enormously influenced by... Uh in fact, almost incalculably influenced by that German experience. In fact, he, he never said action when he was directing a scene in those early days. He always said, Achtung. Hitchcock was given his first chance to direct by Michael Balkan. He made the film in Munich. Hitchcock sketched this story of chorus girls in storyboard form and shook up the staid English script. To help its sales, Balkan imported an American actress for the lead. Virginia Valley, whom Hitchcock turned into a blonde, like most of his heroines. Alfred Hitchcock was a very tubby, brilliant, brilliant, man. He was somebody who could be extremely kind, at the same time a terrible sadist. And that is apparent, I think, in his work too, the, the sadistic side. In the tropics, Virginia Valley's drunken husband, played by Miles Mander, has rejected his native mistress and she sets out to drown herself. Well, he was such a strong personality uh, and very autocratic. But I also remember another side to him, the, 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 the mischievous little boy side of practical jokes. ghastly jokes he played on a fellow called Harry Thorne, who was a prop man. He uh, bet him he wouldn't go home to Watford with handcuffs on. And poor old Harry, fed him, he fed him some uh, stuff that was called x lex which was a great laxative and looked exactly like chocolate. <laughs> and he went <laughs> all the way on a bus to Watford with handcuffs on. <laughs> It was no surprise that Hitchcock's films looked un-English because, like many who cared for the cinema, he looked abroad for inspiration. But few continental films were seen by British audiences unless they lived in London. The German and French and possibly Italian films were shown in the 20s, I think, in the art cinemas, but only in those cinemas as far as I know. I don't think there was a general release for them at all. An exception was a spectacular from Italy. Made partly in colour using the Italian stencil colour system, it was the swan song of the Italian film industry.
Mussolini may have said the cinema was the strongest of his weapons, but it was low on his priorities. Yet, unlike England, the Italians could mount spectacular epics even though their industry was collapsing. One of the few continental films to be widely shown in Britain, it was the costliest of all Italian super productions. The industry did not recover until after the end of the silent period. In England, a general strike was paralyzing the country. Troops were mobilized and thousands of middle-class men were enlisted as special constables to keep the country going. This was as close as Britain came to revolution. Even after the strike, the film industry only rarely depicted working people realistically. Scenes shot at a cotton mill were included in a remarkable film adapted from the play Hindle Wakes. It was co-directed at Gaumont by Morris Elvey and Victor Saville. And of course Hindle Wakes was in the north of England when I was a child, was um, a household word. Everybody knew the story. Wakes Week was still operating throughout the whole of Lancashire and everybody went to Blackpool. And the whole thing was known to every mill girl. Every mill girl was a Fanny Hawthorne. Fanny Hawthorne was played by a new British star, Canadian-born Estelle Brodie. The camera work by William Shenton and Jack Cox, who would work with Hitchcock, was as mobile and inventive as any continental or American film. In 1926 was the 10th anniversary of the Somme. One of the most costly battles, it was at the time regarded as a great victory. A film was staged which was a recreation with some of those who had taken part. One of the two cameramen was Freddie Young. We made this film called The Battle of the Somme. We were on Salisbury Plain, we were on Salisbury Plain for about six, six months. Through uh, bitter cold weather and we Dug, dug trenches and filled them with water so the poor troops were set up to their waist in water, just like they would be in, in the Battle of the Somme. Freddie Young achieved this effect by double exposure. The flashes were produced by carbon arcs and the tree stumps on the horizon were painted on glass. In 1928, MGM opened the Empire Leicester Square, its new flagship theater, with a distinctly English subject, Trelawney of the Wells, made in Hollywood. 
MGM already owned the massive Tivoli and the Strand. British production now accounted for only 5% of the film shown in the United Kingdom. Clara Bow, the latest sensation in America, the It Girl. Julie Bouchier was working at Harrods in the late 20s. They came to me and said, have, have you seen the film at the plaza? It's called Man Trap. And you look just like the girl in it. I thought, well, I'm getting to be a very common type. <laughs> I look like everybody else. So I went, and there was Clara Bow, vamping Percy Marmont. And I thought, oh, how wonderful. I'd love to be up there, vamping Percy Marmont. Two years later, I was. Everybody went on saying, here we have an English Clara Bow. We have got an English girl who's got some it, because it was, uh, we weren't allowed to call it sex appeal in those days, but that's what it was. However popular in England, Chili Boucher's films were hardly ever shown in America, despite having American directors and American-trained cameramen. To force the Americans to loosen their stranglehold on the distribution system became a mission for director Sidney Morgan. Hoping to restrict their imports, he and George Ridgewell lobbied through Parliament a quota act for British films. Well, that was a little bit of a poison chalice in the end because the Americans got round to the idea they would produce their quota films, which they did, at a pound a foot. The quota bill brought a new level of employment for British studios, and cheap films provided a training ground for new talent. But if British films were often poorly produced before, now the incompetence became routine. This quota film depended on the wireless to do its work for it. A race meeting has such importance for the plot that the director intercuts strict titles with newsreel shots. Small wonder such films were sometimes shown to the theatre cleaners in the morning and never seen again. Sound had arrived in America in 1927, but its consequences were delayed. The Paramount Studios at Islington had been bought by Michael Balkan. The studios still stand, and the name of his company can still be seen on the wall. It is one of the few names of early British cinema to inspire a degree of pride. Balkan took no notice of sound. We embarked on a large program of silent pictures, paying no heed at all to, you know, I'd walk a million miles for one of your smiles. And when gaily on, probably the most important film that we ever made, was uh, The Constant Nymph, you know, with Ivan Novello and Mabel Poulton, who played the original Tessa. Made partly on location in Austria by Adrian Brunel, the film established Mabel Poulton as one of England's most talented actresses. And with Ivan Novello in the lead as Lewis Dodd, a composer, the film proved the most popular British release of 1928. The final sequence showed Lewis Dodd and Tessa having run away to a continental hotel. Tessa is feeling odd and complains that the room is stuffy.
Tessa has loved Lewis for years. Only at the end does he return that love. Too late. Comedy Thriller was made by Gainsborough, maintaining their co-production arrangements in Germany. Directed by Geyser von Bolfery, it used German studio methods, including miniature trains, and a partly German cast. Guy Newell, who had once directed Fox Farm, played the lead in this adaptation of Arnold Ridley's play. A group of travellers is marooned at a lonely English station. The climax, the appearance of the ghost train, was less like a British or even a German film than a Russian or French one. The continental style was maintained in one of the most highly praised British films of the silent period. Underground was written and directed by Anthony Asquith, the son of the wartime Prime Minister, and almost the first member of the establishment to work in the cinema. He so admired the German cinema that he brought a German lighting consultant to work with his cameraman. The girl has been rejected by her lover, a power station worker. She confronts him at work. On his first film, Asquith had been writer and co-director with A.V. Bramble. But Bramble had never made a film looking like this. It was inspired by recent scandals in Hollywood. Unknown to the actors in the story, a live round has been placed in the shotgun by a jealous lover. In 1925, Asquith was one of the founders of the Film Society. I was a tremendous film buff. I belonged to the Film Society, which Irish Barry ran so well. And on Sundays, we used to go to the New Gallery of Cinema in Regent Street. And I saw all the uh, German films, the great Waxworks and Galligari, and, and the Russian films Mother and uh, Potemkin, and a whole lot of what were considered very highbrow films in those days. Among the Film Society's presentations was the one outstanding contribution made by the British cinema, the documentary. There had been thousands of factual films, but very few had combined the people and the events with creative cutting and photography. John Grierson, inspired, as he said, by Robert Flaherty, the Russians and by Westerns, directed a film which formed the basis for the British documentary movement. The opening of the BIP studios at Elstree gave a boost to British films. The emphasis was on the word international, especially when the company brought in the film critic of the Evening Standard, 
Walter Mycroft. And he had a passion for the German cinema. And that accounts for the fact that um, uh, such directors as E.A. Dupont were to be found working at BIP. Dupont made a film set in Piccadilly which was scripted by Arnold Bennett, but it still had a strongly German flavour. Hardly surprising when BIP employed a German director, German cameraman and even a German art director. A small part was played by Charles Lawton, yet another who would find fame in America before returning. Jamison Thomas played the nightclub owner in Thrall to His Dancer, the American actress Anna May Wong. Released at the end of the silent era, but regarded as one of the finest of all British silent films, was Asquith's Cottage on Dartmoor. The story of a prisoner who escapes on the lonely moor, it was told as an extended flashback. The man had worked in a barber shop and had fallen in love with a manicurist. Driven mad with jealousy, he suspects she has fallen for a wealthy customer. Anthony Asquith showed entirely visually how the tension reached breaking point. the British films of any ambition seem to have been transformed by the German style. Maurice Elvey resorted to old-fashioned British patriotism as if to prove that England had a style of her own. But there was something doomed in the choice of Britain's greatest military blunder especially when LV needed army cooperation. Had the newsreels been at Balaclava, the charge of the Light Brigade might have looked like this. Except for one thing, hardly anyone gets killed.
The event is shown as a glorious feat of arms, and only Lord Raglan's reaction suggests that anything's wrong. The British cinema had at last shown itself capable of outstanding work, but it was sabotaged by lack of interest from the government and a crippling lack of investment. The Americans were planning a new offensive with sound. Was this a battle that the British, with their pitiful forces, could ever hope to win?